What's up, everyone, and welcome to DI Radio, the talk show where I interview influential people within the Smash community. And this is Vicky Kitty. What's up? How are you doing, Vicky Kitty? Pretty good. You're hanging in there, you know, being safe during the quarantine, wearing a mask, by the way. But other than that, you know, just taking every day as it comes, just kind of readjusting to the remote life. I know how you feel. I think I, that's we kind of talked about a little bit in the pre-show, like just get, getting used to. Do I clean my room today? Do I? Nobody saw me in this oh, yeah. T-shirt. Do I wear it again? That's that's been my dilemma. <laughs> the real the real thing that I've been asking myself is how many other casters out there that are working remotely are also wearing their pajama pants that they get out of bed in and then just wear a very nice town with a vest on. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually the that's actually the bigger question indeed like <laughs> now that i think about it like i've seen a couple broadcasts now i'm like i wonder if he's just wearing the suit on top and he's just wearing like nike shorts this is <laughs> me <laughs> i'll expose myself all, every day i mean it's extra comfy but hey man and then you wear your nice pajama socks i mean we're out there we got comfortable broadcasts while also getting some great games at the same time exactly i think comfort that's the one thing i've always loved about being at home is that comfort but now you get to do commentary at home in the comfort of your own home like it's 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 kind of like a more of a bigger w than an l except not being able to go out as much often but yeah i mean after a little bit now you know i just miss all my friends i miss smash tournaments i miss mm. just being able to you know travel and, and just reunite at like really nice uh get together like food places that we usually visit that kind of make it traditional yeah but um you know like it, it feels nice and comfortable at first but after a few months you know i just miss the smash community <laughs> i agree i agree i miss it a lot uh for those of you guys who may or may not know me of course you guys probably see me i do commentary at msm yeah, you might see me running your pools. You might see me uh, in the background working with the streamer. Sometimes I am running the stream to cover for the streamer. Sometimes I am getting matches. I don't know. I'm kind of a jack of all trades, master of none almost. But uh, this is the pilot episode, guys. Of course, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, things have changed a lot recently. I know a lot of people have reached out to me, have probably tweeted at me or have messaged me. And they've asked me, Vance, when are you doing a podcast again? And I kind of told them, like, uh, maybe someday. I don't know. But I uh, want to give a big shout out to JMX for also being a really good influence on me and my good buddy Arrow. I know he kind of grabbed me by my shirt and he told me, like, you're doing everything right and wrong and this is how you do it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to try now. Um, so enough about me. I know who you are, Vicky Kitty. But for those who don't know, what is your elevator pitch? Give me the elevator, give me the elevator pitch of Vicky Kitty. I want to know for those who don't know, which will surprise me, by the way, but. I think you froze. No. Okay, am I frozen? Can you see me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you that's, see that's, me? Hello? That's the beauty of working. Oh. Okay. <laughs> that's the beauty of working within, you know, at home, right? The, <laughs> the signal and the servers go like really weird. But I don't know if you heard my question. Sorry. Is everything all good? I yeah, I did. So. Can you see me all good though? Yeah, yeah. I can see you. I can see you good. Seeking a little bit off. I'm good. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. So, elevator pitch. We got the elevator pitch part. Yeah. All right, all right. So I'm the one that sounds like a 12 year old little boy when I commentate your Overwatch and Smash matches. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> Mic drop. That's me. That's me. That's right. Deal with it. Um, I think that's one of the things that I've always grown to I appreciate about you when it comes to commentary is you have. When I first when I first saw like I guess I will definitely fall. I have to admit, you know, I have to be humble here. I did think that at first, and then though you know when they finally switch the scene, and I'm like, oh my god, the person who is commentating this is not only good at a commentary, but she she sounds amazing. She's good. She's she's got the skills to back it up. And who cares if she sounds like you like what you said, like a twelve year old commentator? She's got the she's got better school than me, right? So that's that's all that matters at the end of the day. Um, and I brought you here honestly because you've been. I think I've watched, and a lot of us in general, a lot of people have watched you grow from doing smash commentary to doing locals to seeing you at regionals to seeing you at majors if i'm not, correct me if i'm not mistaken i think i saw you did an overwatch commentary i think it was in shanghai it was in taiwan actually taiwan taiwan thank you thank you um you did overwatch commentary in taiwan and then now you're a part of doing contenders and doing commentary for overwatch in general and i'm before i knew it i blinked my eyes and now I was I was playing Smash Four, telling how cool Overwatch is to everyone. And then now I'm telling like, hey guys, remember Vicky Kitty? Now now she does commentary for Overwatch, and 
she you've grown in such a short amount of time i kind of want to say within five years actually within five years that it is just amazed me and i kind of wanted to bring you on to tell your story you know i we talked a little bit about it in the pre-show right i kind of want to know the beginning you know how did you start i uh, you know who who bought you the game boy who bought you the 64 you know what 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 brought you to video games like you know the humble beginnings tell, tell me about what what was it like? I mean, you live in Florida, so hopefully, I hope you're safe right now. Because you know, at the time of this recording, guys, there's a hurricane, right? I hope you're safe. Yeah, everything's uh, all good. It, it honestly felt like a, a tropical storm, like tickling us more than anything. I don't know if it's just the inner Floridian speaking out of me, because usually, if it's not more than like a Category Three, we don't really freak out too often. But it's kind of like well, let's prepare just for the safety purposes and damage issues that right. could come if we don't prepare. But um, no, we're all good out here. And it's actually funny how you open up with, you know, who? how did you start? Like, who bought you the console that really started everything? So that story is funny because I actually wasn't allowed to have my own console until I was a lot older because I grew up in a very traditional household where uh, girls were supposed to play with dolls and not play with, like, video games. Yeah, and... um. It's funny because dad and I were like best friends. And back then my dad was, it, he still is a very avid gamer. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that had all the consoles in the house that I would sneak around as a kid and play on when I wasn't allowed. Um, because my my mom and my parents are very young actually like both my parents are 45 so my mom it, it's not like it, this was like uh mm -hmm. my mom being, you know old school or anything like that it was just kind of like how my mom grew up and my mom had a brother who it kind of was like the same way in that household and uh my mom also just saw like me she saw how i reacted to playing with video games since i never was allowed to play with video games and i was very obsessive so like the whole <laughs> traditional like, you can't play games unless you get good grades and if you get good grades you could play on the weekends for x amount of hours and that wasn't until i was a lot older but with the way that i started out with video games i would never forget so my grandmother was essentially like my babysitter for the first like four years of my life and she took care of me and my uncle was in high school at the time so my uncle had like the snes and all these different like consoles hanging out in the room that my grandma and I would sneak into his room while he was in high school and we would play like Mario Brothers. And it was great because I, I loved being player too because I liked the color green. So oh, okay. I liked Luigi. So I was Luigi, my grandma was Mario. And that's kind of like my, my that's kind of how I got obsessed with it. I want to mm -hmm. say obsessed because I could put it down and my uncle would get home and then we would have to pretend like we were never playing in his room in the first place. Cause you know, 16 year old uncle just wants to like go home, do his homework shoot you know shoot the shit and then just hang out and not do anything else like not find out that his little niece is like sneaking to his room playing video games without his permission but um that kind of was a thing for the first four years of my life and then once i you know she started my grandma started doing her own thing and i started staying home my mom started taking care of me and was able to more often uh i wasn't really allowed to have my own console i didn't even have a tv in my room until i was like i want to say 16 years old so I, I I was very more into books and then the time that I was playing video games was in a separate room and I had a bedtime cutoff date. But when I first got my console, the one console I would never forget getting for Christmas. We had an N64 and a PlayStation and all that stuff, but that was my dad's. Like, I don't consider it to be mine, although I did play games on it. I had Mario Party 3, I had GoldenEye, like, I, I just, it was, it was a very fun time in my life, yeah. but again it wasn't my console I, I played mario 64 and all that stuff and then when i consider what my console was like for for me had my name on it was one christmas morning i woke up and in the garage underneath a laundry basket that was turned upside down was the silver gamecube <laughs> it was the limited edition zelda, game it was, was it the one that had the zelda demo disc the, yes, yes the zelda demo disc that had every single mm. zelda game and the wind waker 10 minute demo on it and it, if i were to tell you how i reacted as a kid i still remember like it was one of the, the most like memorable christmas mornings that i ever had right, right. and i was so happy because like now that was my console now that this was like a statement for me like to tell me that i i, I could play my own games i could ask for my own games and i could have like all the, everything that I, my friends be like able to do i was able to do too 
so I, that was that was such a fun time in my life. I had Melee. Melee was that one game that I played all the time as like a young child because I was an only child for the first seven years of my life. So I had to entertain myself somehow. The CPUs were my siblings. <laughs> like those were my siblings that I played against. It wasn't until my, my younger sister came into the picture. Like she was like two years old and I gave her a game controller. I'm like, fight me. <laughs> like Looking at me like, oh, I can't even speak words fully here. You're telling me to fight you with like this melee game. But that was around that time when um, things really started kicking up for me as a gamer. And then when I got a little older, I was able to have my own PlayStation 3. And again, still no TV in my room. The only way I was able to play uh, any console games was in my parents' bedroom. Not even in the living room, it was my parents' bedroom. So that I was always under supervision and all that stuff. And I was heavily into shooters for a really long time, specifically Modern Warfare 2. And that game is is what took over my life. I would say influenced my life. And it's also where I got my gamer tag from for like... I want to say three solid years. Like even when Black Ops was out, I was still avidly playing Modern Warfare 2. When I I think it was like Modern Warfare 3 came out, I was still playing Modern Warfare 2. Or I think it was Ghost before Modern Warfare 3. But one of those two oh, games, oh, I like think, I, I think, if I remember I think it was Ghost and then Modern Warfare 3 in like that order. I think no, Ghost came after Modern Warfare 3 because I remember Ghost okay. was that that game in between Xbox 360 to Xbox One. And I remember telling everyone, like, oh, shoot, this is really weird because now the Xbox One is coming out. But Ghost mm -hmm. is available on both consoles. So I remember having to be one of those people. I think at that time I was living in NorCal. Yeah, I was living in NorCal in the dorm for, for like, a semester. And I remember I, like, somehow, by some way, I ponied up the cash to buy an Xbox One and still buy a, mo a model a Call of Duty Ghost twice. And then I just remember all my friends were looking at me like, wow, you really have money. I was like, no, dude, I just happened to work overtime that one week. Um, but if you, sorry, really quick. So if you guys are seeing cutoffs, obviously at the time we were recording, uh, we were recording live on Discord. I know probably it's pretty obvious by now, right? If you guys have listened to any podcast in the recent weeks, you know, we're doing it on Discord. So if things are cutting off, hey, don't worry. Just the way things are. I appreciate you guys for sticking around. And also, it's really cool to know that Vicky Katie and I also shared the same console. We both had the limited edition silver GameCube with the Legend of Zelda collection. Oh, hell yeah. That's like, I'm with you. I was I was a single child. And my grandma raised me for like four years of my life. It's actually really funny because I relate to you in that sense where the only reason why my uncle found out, and this is my fault, is because he hadn't beaten Star Fox 64 yet. And I did not turn, I did it. Star Fox 64 is like an arcade game. So I used to tell everybody there was no real save file. There's no like special thing that you can save and you can save when you're in this area from what oh I remember. My God. And I couldn't save the fact that I was at Andros. <laughs> Hold on, I think you're cutting off for a little bit. Um, I couldn't save that I was at Andros and I turned off the TV. And when my uncle came to play Star Fox, he noticed that the 64 was on and he was like, I've never been to this level ever so then he walks downstairs and he sees me and i was like oh yeah that was me by the way and then he was totally cool with it but like he was just amazed like you got this far by yourself and i was like yeah I, I have nothing better to do and also my grandma and i used to wait for my mom and my grandpa to just come up from home and we used to watch inuyasha together which is the weirdest bonding oh experience God. anybody could ever have with their grandparents but that was me that was me and my grandma we used to watch Inuyasha together and it was just really really weird so so just funny how we relate that way like we both received we both had an uncle who had the console we both received that really cool silver gamecube both of our grandparents you know were, were looking after us and then you know both of our my mom is also a very young mother she's like barely hitting 50 so but go mm -hmm. on you 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 were saying you got you got into you got into Call of Duty right yeah, yeah. So the, the Inuyasha thing, by the way, is super cool. I would love to have that anime bonding experience with my grandparents. That's actually super sick. But yeah, no, like I was playing Mono for two and I actually looked it up because I was curious. So it was Mono for two, Black Ops, mm -hmm. then Mono for three, then Black Ops two and then Ghost. Yeah. So then Ghost came out like five years after that. So yeah, I was playing Mono for two, like as an avid fan, even going into Black Ops two. And then I think it was around Black Ops two that I started actually trying out that game because something about Black Ops that I was like really bothered about. And then I like was one of those hardcore like I don't want to play a different Modern for you know Call of Duty game that isn't Modern for two <laughs> like intervention only. Meet me in Rust. And then I actually started playing Black Ops and Black Ops, and I actually really liked it a lot. Like around. Mm -hmm. 
time that Modern for three came out so i actually didn't play Modern for three and then started playing black ops more when Modern for three came out so i was just so backwards in that way of thinking but no i'm with you uh, i'm with you i i, I, yeah, I I was like so big on shooters for a really long time. And that also stems down to the fact that my dad would play a uh, Counter-Strike on the computer. So I would like, when I went, whenever he was going to the kitchen to make dinner, cause my dad's like a chef in the house. Um, I would sneak onto his Counter-Strike account when I was like five, six and I would play Counter-Strike. And like, I again, like I was just always trying to play a game, man. I just wanted to play. Like I was just here, like trying to crawl out here on the computer chair, like just trying to play my games. And um, I think that that like pent up frustration of trying to, to just be a gamer ended up just spewing out. And that's when like, I got my console. I got the GameCube. I got Pokemon. Um, Mm -hmm. I got Sorry, you kid. Right. Snow Warriors. I had Kirby Air Ride. I had Melee. I had so many different games. I had this Harry Potter, uh, you know, Quidditch game. I had I remember that so one. many games. Yeah, no, I, I was popping off with the GameCube. The GameCube, I think I had the most games I've ever had in any console. And then it kind of just became natural at that point where I was just constantly on a game, you know, and, and mm -hmm. my parents were completely okay with it. And then when it got into, like, competing... I've always been an avid Smash Brothers fan. Again, like that's the type of franchise that helped me over when I was a single child and like right. I didn't have any siblings to play with. So Smash, essentially the CPUs were those siblings that challenged me. So, um, you know, when Brawl came out, I had so much fun with that game because the graphics were updated, there was more right. characters, and I never looked things up because I never wanted to spoil myself with like how to unlock characters. So when like, I had to unlock new challengers. I was popping off because I never knew who would come up because I never right, looked. Right, right. So I, that 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 element of surprise is what really got me excited with Smash in general. Mm -hmm. And between Melee, Brawl, and then eventually I was about to start college and I would play Smash 4 with my group of friends from high school and college. And I didn't know that there was a competitive scene because I honestly just never looked it up like i just never looked up in my mind i didn't know why i just never looked up like where tournaments are nearby me and so i met somebody in college who actually introduced me to locals within south florida so then i went to my local and i immediately befriended everybody in that venue everybody was so nice so welcoming mm. and i it was like my entire world changed that day because i knew that i needed to take this seriously and like my sense of competition just sparked up i'm a very competitive person and <laughs> i i found something to work on and that that something was smash mm -hmm. no that i think that's pretty cool i'm with you i like i grew up a single child like i said you know my grandma watched over me i played smash i never bothered to it wasn't until i got into my college years where i was like i like this game a lot and then i think at the time I had a really love hate relationship with Brawl because like you like you I didn't know how to unlock the characters. I didn't want to know how to unlock them. I just wanted everything to come out natural and I didn't want to look up guides or anything. How do I play this character? And playing the story mode which was Subspace Emissary was a really cool way of like I was the only kid on my block who stayed up for 8 hours straight playing this game to unlock every character so that everybody can come over and I could give everybody a reason to come over to play all the characters and everyone would be amazed. I I enjoyed it. I enjoyed that game. And I'm with you. Like I didn't know that competitive nature until I got older and then I think it was might have been I think it was uh when it was Project Melee. There you go. When it was Project Melee is when I finally started to look at like locals in NorCal and I went to one and I had such a good time everyone was welcoming everyone was really cool um and it like kind of started to slowly bring me out more um but so you know you grew up you started playing the game when you're playing you're playing smash you're playing smash for you when you went to university went to college when did you start looking at commentary how the how did you approach that when did, when did you start approaching that um so it's funny i i don't think ev like everyone just goes into competing in smash and says to themselves that they want to be a commentator i don't mm -hmm. think that's like you know usually when people want to compete there they want to look to be a better player they want to you know they want to become a top player or something like that or at least be like in the top heads of the competition when it comes to at least being within their region um so when i started casting it wasn't something that i'm just like entered the scene and said i 
I want to be a commentator. It was more so like I was a, a, a competitor for a very long time. I, by very long, I mean like a few months into me finding the scene. I want to mm -hmm. say within six months um, of competing within the same local venue of South Florida. And our tournament organizer, the head tournament organizer at the time for our local was DC. Um, DC, who moved to Seattle, who works for the Pokemon company. Oh, now, okay. yeah, he was our tournament organizer for South Florida. He grew up here. He even graduated from the same school as I did, like the same university and stuff like that. So he grew up in South Florida and stuff like that. And he was like, Vicky, come to the commentator room. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I sat down next to him. And how I took the approach of casting was I, I already looked at this gigantic projector that was in the main room of the venue with all the other players. And we would just talk about our opinion about what was happening in the game, the, mm -hmm. the way that things were transitioning. And I felt like it was the same equivalent to what casting would have been in my mind, at least when I sat down at that commentator de desk for the first time. And in my mind, I was like, I'm just talking about the game, but with my friends. And we're talking about what's happening in the game together. And that's how I approached it. I was just talking about the player decisions, what was transitioning within the game, why interactions happened, mm -hmm. laughing about it, having a good time because we love making fun of Rage and Smash 4, like talking about how, yeah, he totally got it, but he did it because Rage got it instead. And like just memeing on like how, how like, unfortunate for some players to like not clutch things out and just and again these players were friends that i had made within those six months so like it felt more personal and like more like i understand this mindset for this player this other player is more aggressive because of the character that they decide to play with but also their secondaries that really help support their aggressive play um and talking about things like that for the first time sitting on the on the desk I was met with a lot of like hype a lot of people liked it and versus gaming center at the time for that smash 4 era was pulling in like 500 to 800 viewers for a local oh, and I... to us that was huge like i think that's still really good for a local to pull in 500 to 800 viewers for smash 4 so like when the the viewership was higher than normal the night that we decided to commentate top eight that dc mm. just pulled me into the versus gaming center commentator booth and i was just met with so much support from the scene that i i wanted to keep doing it i i felt encouraged to keep casting and mm -hmm. also realized that point Hold of on, view sorry, you, you, you talking verbally second. about the decision making of these players it's all good. I, I found out that, like, talking about the point of view of these players, talking about the decision-making of these individual players and why they were going for the things that they were going for in the game made me see things that I couldn't see when I was the player. So I was mm -hmm. able to get better as a, as a Smash Brothers competitive player while also commentating because casting allowed you to see things from a lot of different point of views. Right, right, right. I think that's the one thing that I can tell you guys and tell everyone and tell you as well because... On the East Coast and the West Coast, you know, we will always see West Coast and East Coast, you know, talk about the streams and all of that stuff. On the West Coast side, for us, things were very different. So it was very much of like, we only had fire and dice for a very, very long time. And I just remember like trying to find streams and all this stuff. And I remember like seeing like, oh, versus Gaming Center. What the heck? It has like 800 views. And then I would see Xanadu and I was like, wow, these all these streams you know i think that's kind of what inspired the west coast to finally start pulling things you know assets together and start you know building wanting to build up that high level you know not only the high level stream but bring in the views bring in the players and stuff like that and i remember just being like looking at what we like you said right 800 views on a stream and that to me was amazing you know just for a local i was so amazed you know usually i would see 800 views maybe for like like an because back then I was into anime fighters, so I would see like 800 views for an anime fighter, and I'd be like super amazed. But when I saw 800 views for like something that's even higher than anime fighter, that totally blew my mind. And also shout out to DC because I had the pleasure of meeting him, maybe I want to say two years ago. And super nice, super cool guy. Um, I didn't even know he was from Florida until some like until someone like, oh yeah, I came from Florida. I'm from that region. But also I didn't know he could commentate other anime fighters. He was he's super into Pokemon. So shout outs to him. He's a really, really cool guy. I had a really good conversation when I met him at, um, I think it was SoCal Regionals, like two years ago, I want to say. I had some work doing there. 
Yeah, so, he's the OG sensei. Yeah, yeah, he, I, he was super cool, and I just did, I was so amazed. Like, wow, this guy is commentating Blaze Blue Cross Tag. I, I I only knew him as a Smash commentator, and he's doing all these other anime fighters here at SCR. But so you're 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 going into commentary. You're having a good time. You're having a blast. You're also like, and they think that's what I tell other people. I uh, granted, I don't really compete as often because I I'm somebody who gets salty. <laughs> really really horribly but like i tell people sometimes i like, feel that <laughs> I, I, I try not to complete because i get salty but also um people who know me they know like sometimes i don't compete because i'm usually the one on the mic all night long and i don't i don't mind that at all sometimes they need somebody to be on there all night and i really don't mind so sometimes i just tell people i set a tournament where i might try to compete and i'll compete at that tournament because i know i'm not going to be on the mic but if um, when it comes to msm i just tell people i don't compete because just in case they need someone on there i'm there but when it comes to going from a local to a, a regional to a major, when did you start seeing that happen? When did you start like being approached for that? That's what I want to know. Like, how what was it like to go from "Hey, Vicky Kitty, come back, come to the back room, do commentary," to "Hey, we're gonna fly you out. Here's a hotel room. Here's you know, here here's this, here's that." When when did that start happening, and how did you take it? What, what was it like? I worked for pennies for a really long time. Um, I mean, I, I know that everybody, I, I want to say, I want to confidently say that everybody in the scene probably did the same thing as mm -hmm. me, probably took on free gigs and like worked for pennies for a really long time. Except like, I entered the scene when a lot of these veterans have been around since Brawl. I entered the scene like only, I want to say, a year into Smash 4. So I was still like, I want to consider myself new to the scene because even though I have five years under my belt of being involved with the Smash community, mm -hmm. there's people that have over like 15 years, you oh, know, yeah. and like, so like I'm still a baby in in the eyes of everybody who still had came from Brawl, but mm -hmm. in Smash Four, the I I was like thrown to the sharks, <laughs> and the way that I could e explain what I mean by that, so, um, in South Florida. There's a player called uh, Black Guy Gamer, mm -hmm. and he's this super like tall football player, like Wario player, who was my static co-caster within South Florida. And everybody named this Biggie Smalls because this man's is like six six, and I am five feet tall. So on the mic, sitting down. <laughs> I'm like not even up to his shoulder. So like it, the proportion of whatever camera work the stream runner had to do was absolutely hilarious. Like the memes of Vicky has to sit on an Apple box went beyond like, it, it was just, it was funny. It was way too funny. Mm. Um, and we, uh, us as a static duo casting, like a casting duo, mm. we, we were put into a regional for MVG. And it was called, I think that was called Frame Perfect. And it was the first Frame Perfect that ever happened mm -hmm. within, it was like, I remember the venue was called Gods and Monsters or something like that. And I think it was in Orlando. This happens like October of 2015, I want to say. twenty. Yeah, it was October 2015 or 2016. Sure. And that was a really big regional because Mewtwo King got upsetted. Um... It was, I think it was grand finals of, it was the big soul versus DJ Jack match where it was Lil Mac on Duck Hunt versus Ryu. And it was such a big deal for that tournament because people didn't see Lil Mac go very far. You know, soul was the Lil Mac enthusiast and Ryu had recently come out. So people didn't have good Ryu plays yet. Like right. local locust wasn't on board yet like mm. there were so many like things were still developing in the meta for smash 4 so this was like a very hype moment within like the tournament series and when i was put into doing frame perfect that was my first regional ever like that i went from casting a local like two months prior for the first time ever to two months later hey we want you to commentate this regional Mm -hmm. and i was nervous but they had me with my so static co-caster so i felt yeah. confident because together we really worked well in unison but also we were learning together we were growing together and i was very open to feedback because i wanted to know what i could do differently my approaches and like how i could improve as a commentator 
And I had notes even back then. I had books of books and notes because we had players within our South Florida region that played characters that you wouldn't see on board anywhere else in the States. We had Dath, who was the Robin enthusiast, which at the time, Robin was still unknown to people. Yeah. So like being able to hit people with the knowledge of like what Robin does. We had Rio from Florida, who was the Ike enthusiast. We had Soul, the Little Mac enthusiast. Mm -hmm. Florida in general was a, a home for all the unique characters to come out in full force. And they were like the dark horse that you don't know like what to expect, especially with rage being a factor in Smash 4. Like you couldn't predict the outcome. And like, because a lot of these characters weren't really known on how to approach that matchup, Florida knew how to do it because we had 8 Man, the Rob guy. Like we had so many, we had ESAM, we had MVD. We had so many good players that like, I felt blessed as a caster to be able to have all this firsthand experience, not only approaching the players personally to see what the characters do, but also having that in my back pocket of like throwing that out there, spitting some facts on the mic and talking about like Robin kill confirms out of, you know, hitting them with a book, you know, and like book into Thoron and like just being able to know all these little quirks about the game made me feel very confident, but I also felt like I was teaching the community something because I felt like I was the bridge between the players and the audience and learning that early on and trying to learn on criticism little things like how to synergize well with your co-caster right. when to give them space to talk because of that whole thing that we were talking about in the pre-show of like they're not being static positions within commentary within smash specifically i don't know too much beyond the fgc side of things but i know within smash specifically those role-based uh commentary roles that you would have within like mobas and like overwatch and league etc don't really sit themselves within smash because casters aren't hired based on them being specifically play by player color it's more like learning to adapt to how your co-caster commentates and then following up on that in a very nice way to be able to compliment them and i had to learn that very early on in my career because again like i was thrown to the sharks when i was told that i wasn't casting a regional within the first two months of me learning how to cast at all <laughs> i think you yeah. said that so perfectly that that's kind of like and I could go on. I don't really want to talk about myself because this is this. I really, I'm really enjoying hearing you talk. It's about relatable this. though. It's relatable it though. Is. So it I is. completely get you. I, I, I tell, but also I really want to go back, just backtrack a little bit. That was a funny contrast between SoCal and Florida, where I used to tell people SoCal was the land of the top tiers. It was like we had ev to be top ten or top twenty in SoCal, you had to go up against. I, well, I think at that time, it was like Mewtwo King, Tyrant, Mr. E, Mr. R, Void, all these top talent just living here. And I was like, dude, if you want to get top 20, good luck, because the top 10 players are already international talent. And not only that, you have to consistently get used to the matchup of Diddy, Sheik, Rosal uh, oh and, yeah, Rosalina and Luma, which we, I think we only had like- Fallen. Two. Yeah, we had Fallen. He was from San Diego. And he would- Shout outs to him because he would make those. Um, when I talked to AC, he told me we would make those drives all the way from San Diego to I, li I live in what's known as the 818 region of SoCal. So this is like Northridge, um, North Hollywood, the, um, Universal Studios, all that area up here. The, he used to tell me we used to have to drive all the way to what was essentially Northridge to from San Diego to Northridge. So I don't know how to character, I don't know the distance, you know, for Florida. I don't really don't know how to calculate that for you, but. It was a far drive. It's like a two-hour drive to get to just the local. But SoCal was only full, full, <laughs> full. Jesus. It was only full of like top characters. It was Fox. It was Sheik. It was Diddy. It was all these top characters. So when I saw a lot of Florida mods, like you said, Rob, Pikachu, uh, looking, I, I remember I loved watching Rio because Ike was so unique to me. And I was you know, watching all these characters. I was like, wow, they have such a. They have Robin. They have Robin here in SoCal. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god we had so many crazy characters like looking back at smash 4 it's funny because like to think that now we are smash 4 veterans when like i don't know i don't consider that because smash 4 was around for like what four years five mm -hmm. years roughly so like to think that like we're considered smash 4 veterans like back in the day it's just it, it's saying that back in the day just doesn't sound right to me but it, it really was like that long ago we had uh true blue who you know sonic enthusiast Dath, who was the robin enthusiast within the state of florida static manny followed right afterwards with sonic mm -hmm. you had um, rio with ike you had wonder bread 
So with Little Mac, and we're talking about Little Mac mains, which are the scariest in my opinion because people hella slept on that character, and that oh, character so was so scary, man. So scary. We had so many, like we had 8-Bit Man. We had we had so many good players back in the day. I mean, we had, you know, people who out here played really good Ryu. We had so many good characters. I mean, I played Corrin. I was very I think I was like one of the few Corrin players except for uh, Elia. South Florida, who really pushed the characters meta in the state. Um, there was just so uh, the variety of characters within our region was insane. I mean, we also had people who played top tiers, but then uh, you know when Bayonetta came out, we had new players come out of the woodworks. We had a uh, child who was the Bayonet player within the state of Florida, who mm-hmm. uh, not only almost beat Zero at Genesis, he I believe took Renai to like game three, and like this is somebody who went to Genesis, and Genesis was his first like tournament that three, he ever right? tried. Genesis three, I think, if I remember, yeah, yeah, I remember it was like Genesis that three years. Genesis, mm-hmm. and, and and like with these these players when they came out to Florida tournaments and we met them for the first time, Florida was like a family. Like it, that's how I saw everybody as. So like not only as a caster was I telling the audience about what their characters were doing in real time, I was sharing the player's story because think about it: when sponsors watch these players perform, what's the first thing they're gonna hear? The player, the story, they're you. <laughs> the casters and they're gonna hear how the casters talk about them and like that's how i see commentating for these players is we're selling them we are mm-hmm. we are trying to help boost their career and obviously we can't do everything for them because that's their own brand and they got to right. build themselves up but we could help that you know and that was something that i learned early on within commentary and i think taking up an approach that a lot of uh, spectators, like a lot of people from the audience, when it comes to breaking down commentary, a lot of them don't know like the science behind why casters do certain things and why they approach in different styles and why different commentary suits different audiences. And like, if I could explain for myself, since I can't speak for other casters, I really wanted to be the caster that helps get this top five player who is like, let's say 15, 16 years old, land that perfect sponsor spot that they deserve. So that way they could start boosting a career and showing to their parents that professional gaming is within that that realm of possibility. Because now we are currently entering an era within esports that you could tell mom and dad, yeah, this is my future job. This is what I want to grow up to be. And people still nowadays are thinking about that and like, you know, that's not stable gaming. Like, how how are you going to pay for your retirement? Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's more stable now than anything. I, I kind of like laugh at that a lot because I tell people coincidentally now, well, now sports is slowly coming back. Shout out to the Lakers winning the first game. <laughs> but now the sports is coming back, you know, and it's going to settle in a little bit. But I tell people this is the golden era in which esports can really show itself what it has been showing everyone for the past few years. I've been telling people if you think esports isn't a billion dollar industry, you're sleeping on it because it is so rich of so much talent and so much longevity that people just don't see it i'm i'm god i'm and i'm not complimenting you because i'm also a fan of you but i'm telling you that what you just said was very powerful because i've never that's what i have been trying to do here in socal where i just tell people my first year of commentary was very much me testing myself i wanted to see where i need to improve maybe what i need to understand talking to people um, I was very fortunate that when I got to do locals, if you some of you guys may or may not know him, his name was Pluto. He was a, he was one of our high oh, comment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was one of our high commentators, and I kind of went under his wing a little bit. He kind of showed me the ropes. I listened to his vods, and I went home and I studied. And then little by little, I found myself hanging out, spending nights with Nico, Charlie, Larry, up at three in the morning, getting Korean barbecue, and then just talking to them, hearing their stories. So now that when I finally went on the mic, I could go, hey, guys, this is Charlie the King. This is his profile. Yeah. This is what he does. This is his Twitch. This is his Twitter please follow him he's such a good player he's always doing this so i totally relate to you like that was what i wanted to slowly start doing i wanted to become a caster that could not only just do commentary but could tell everybody sirens are on mine if you guys hear by the way (laughs) (laughs) Uh, i wanted to tell the story of everyone because i felt that that story is not only important to their play style but important to who they are and hoping i mean spoilers because i have i have charlie on the show um I want Charlie to succeed. I want this player to be successful. I want them to show off that, yes, I am 
yes mom and dad i can be sponsored by tsm clg you know all these yeah. names so i totally agree with you but but let's let's yeah let's move forward coming in right like you said you got sent to the sharks you i mean you were like I, that's kind of scary you know two months two months later they're like hey do this regional right now please we, we really love you we want to see more of you do this regional and then, and then and then now you're moving into doing things like majors you're doing you're doing you're doing majors and then now you're doing a nintendo minute and then now you're doing now you're a nintendo brand ambassador <laughs> what i, I want to talk a little bit more on that before i go into some other stuff but like what's what does that feel like what what, what is that that's like being told you're successful but i don't i don't even want to, tell me tell me enough of me tell tell me tell me tell me so so just to just to give some background nintendo is the very like nintendo company mm -hmm. though their consoles was the very first console i put my hands on as a kid remember mm -hmm. like that was my uncle's console so when my grandma played with me i first played mario that was the first super brothers super mario brothers was the first game that i i ever got my hands on as a child um and i love nintendo i grew up with nintendo my first console that i could remember on christmas was nintendo based that gate so cube and like i didn't get into commentary under the the notion that i was going to do anything for nintendo i i, I knew that nintendo wasn't involved within the scene like that so never in my mind did i think that it was within the realm of possibility but within the summer so i started casting around october like that first regional within the summer following that october okay was the summer that i was hired to do a san diego comic-con smash 4 tournament for nintendo so it was within less than a year of me starting out casting that nintendo had reached out to me to work on san diego comic-con and when that happened i fangirled i mean anybody, yeah, yeah, anybody. Yeah, definitely definitely I, I and I got the phone call while being uh, on a Thursday at Versus Gaming Center because I had to walk out of the venue and go to the parking lot and I picked up a phone call and here comes JC with the facts of hey we we talked to a lot of people within the scene and everyone pointed us in your direction because we think that you are the perfect person that we're looking for to do the San Diego commentary uh, for Comic Con for smash 4 and i was so thankful to the people who recommended me so ecstatic to do this event for them that i felt like i was opening a new chapter in my life understand that this was my first year of college i was a student for psychology i was going to school for psychology because i didn't know what the hell i wanted to do in my life <laughs> i didn't know i felt like the same, the to same. go from high school to go from high school to college i in my mind had no idea what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I felt like that was so intense to decide on at that moment that I, I didn't know. So I just went for, you know, after watching all these crime shows, I want to go for the one thing that I thought I was hyped about in that moment. And I was going to be like a criminal investigator or something like that. I don't know. I what, wanted to deep. Sorry, what, I wanted what was your favorite crime show? That's what I'm curious to know. Oh, Criminal Minds. Okay, okay, okay. That's, that's <laughs> I was big on, on yeah, I, I was big on Criminal Minds for years at, when I was younger. And like, I, I just wanted to get into like the psychology of it. But then mm. in my mind, I was like, like, man, but that's so depressing to do for the rest of my life. Like, I don't know if I could really like stomach that and like, like wrap my mind around it for the rest of my life. Like, maybe I just want to dwell into like the psychology aspect of it and like maybe help people sort out issues right. that they don't know. I can't put it. And so, so, you know, I went into college without really knowing what I wanted to do in life. And I want to say thanks to Nintendo and thanks to finding this new hobby. I found out what I'm really passionate about and just found out that like just because I'm getting older doesn't mean I have to put everything in the back burner for my passion and my hobbies. Like what and and you know some people could say otherwise where they don't want to make their hobbies their job. Right. And I think if you find a perfect balance between the two, it becomes not only refreshing for you but it gives you something to wake up to and get excited for if you're going to be working on something that you really love yeah. and when i started getting into getting involved with nintendo that was an eye-opener for me because i never thought that i it, it would expand that far 
-hmm. And it's funny. It actually took me a very long time to get the offer to do to be a Nintendo brand ambassador. But that isn't because of the fact that I just because I was casting their events and I was involved with Smash. It, they actually look at people who who have content right, to right, be right, a Nintendo right. brand ambassador. It's 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 it, even if they have a brand established and they mm -hmm. have a following or anything like that. Like you don't even need to have a following that's insane to become a brand ambassador if you are a content creator and you are constantly like spewing out nintendo based content they will have their eyes on you they're actually very vigilant as to what happens on social media and to what happens between their individual content creators of whoever has like the audience boost to boost right. like a game that they're making videos of and all that stuff so um i started getting very serious with streaming uh, i want to mm. say two years ago and when I, I had like a set schedule in between the nationals and full-time school and I would stream every Tuesdays and third. I know I, I was that's, like that's drowning. I was drowning and like, a, I was just every day I was busy. It was very hard, but I did it at the end of the day. So pat my back. <laughs> yeah, I did it but I, and I made it work. I really made it work. And um, after packs of doing the Nintendo online open, which was like a year ago. Mm -hmm. I was offered the Nintendo brand ambassadorship slightly right after that. So it was, it's only been about a year and a few months now that I've been a Nintendo brand ambassador, but I've worked with them for the last like four years, essentially, yeah. like maybe yeah. once a year. So like I did E3 for them for the last like two, three years. And then I did the Nintendo online open with them. And then I did the San Diego Comic Con event with them. And then it wasn't until literally a year ago was when they offered me, hey, we really like how enthusiastic you are with Nintendo. You mm -hmm. like you, you do a good job at just representing the brand and being enthusiastic about our games. We see that you stream more often now. Do you want to be on board with Nintendo Brand Ambassador Program? I'm, I was like, I would, I would love to represent this program because I felt like, I, I mean... If you look at my desk, I can't even show you right now because the camera's facing me. But, no, but the I, I, the everything, every, I mean, yeah, you can even see, like, I mean, like, <laughs> I just, I really like Nintendo. I've always been a Nintendo kid, and I don't see that changing despite how much older I get. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I tell people one day I'm going to be a 70 year old man, and I'm going to be looking maybe at my great grandchildren. I don't know. And I will just tell them, I remember when I played Breath of the Wild every day and I did 300 hours of this game. And I am so excited to still be 80 and still play Nintendo because that's just the way I am. That's how I enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, you're. I, mean, I think when I think about it like this, you know, I watching your success, like you said, you, it's almost like it happened not necessarily overnight, but like it, it happened of like, I'm getting this. I'm running with it. I'm learning. I'm taking the criticism. I'm writing. I'm writing down what I need to learn. I'm running with it. I'm being sent to the wolves. I'm trying to, I have this lightning in a bottle and I'm using it to fuel me and all that. Stuff. And then going to school. I think when I look back at it, right, that's, that's something amazing that to see it happen and to see where you are now, which we're going to talk about in a second, but like to see all that go through, it's pretty amazing. And it's also pretty powerful because I've always told people I felt that one, not necessarily one of the criticisms, but one of the things that I have always wondered in the back of my mind and people have asked me and I've asked people and it's been an open conversation is. And if you're from SoCal, you've all, you, um, if you're a listener from SoCal, you probably know this as well. Like, There's not a lot of female commentators. And when I told people to see Vicky Kitty come out as super successful and to see her on the mic goes to show that, yes, we do not only need more female voices in gaming and in esports, but you can succeed. You don't need to let this thing hold you back. We we do need that. And I felt like it was a light, a beacon that people could see of like, wow, she's doing it and I can do it too to all the other female gamers, despite, you know, all of the criticisms that you got, which I felt like was really unfair. Like everyone's like, oh, she sounds like a 12 year old. But I was like, who cares, dude? She probably sounds better than you if you got on the mic, right? Like, oh. <laughs> When it came to taking in criticism, so so I actually I actually really applaud like people like Parappa. Um, mm -hmm. he was one of the people who was very vocal about like commentary and the direction of where it was going. Right. Um, and you know we had a rocky start to like 
you know an acquaintance relationship for a bit because he didn't approach it in the very nice way like in a very constructive way but then i personally reached out to him because i was genuinely curious about what i could do as a caster if he had something to say like i want to know because i want to get better i'm not here to make your ears bleed or you know with my voice or anything like that i want to know how do i how do i approach a different style to cater to multiple people's preferences okay mm -hmm. you can't ever you have to learn as a caster that you can't ever please everybody. And that was something oh, so I had to learn early on because, you know, you may not have to like my voice. That's okay. But as long as you are learning something, as long as you are figuring things out about the player who's on the camera, I'm doing my job at the end of the day. And I, mm -hmm. that is what commentary is. It's providing analysis. But then you have to think about, again, structure within commentary. How are you providing that analysis? Are you providing the analysis within the game? Are you providing the background analysis within the, the player? You could, you know, the, as a caster, you could do all of the above. But you also have to, you know, toss a bone to your co-caster to follow up on or else it's going to sound choppy. It's not going to sound pleasant. And it's going to sound worse than a voice being, you know, scratched scratching a chalkboard with your nails you know like it's gonna be worse than hearing a voice that you just may not like mm -hmm. but it's kind of like passing the baton essentially and you uh, being able to follow up and as long as i'm doing my job properly if you could give me some criticism as to how do i could approach things differently what in-depth analysis do you like to hear but also if it's in-depth is it uh, is it allowed to be generalized in a way where a an audience who isn't involved in the competitive scene, can they understand? Can they follow along? Because a lot of players who watch uh, Smash streams, these players are players. They're competitive players. They know how the competitive scene works. But what about your grandma at home? Does she know how the competitive scene works? If I'm talking about, you know, all these, you know, complicated things, will she understand and follow along? If she's not going to be able to do that, how do you expect to grow the scene? So I have to have a good balance in between catering towards the competitive scene but also to the general audience who is also trying to pick up on smash and a prime example of that is actually looking at overwatch league and how they had to make it more digestible to the audience and to the viewers to follow along as to what the hell is going on in a 6v6 because it could be hard to follow along and to follow what the caster is saying if you don't follow the game 24 7 if you don't follow the meta 24 7 because it's constantly changing yeah so they have to make that content digestible for the average person so that way they could come back and they could watch the next stream because they followed along with the last stream and now they could have something to build up on yeah that's uh wow i'm sorry <laughs> that was that was so perfectly said and i agree i i think that's one of the things i've always appreciated about like me me myself learning to do commentary take like a, like you take criticism try to figure out other things ask friends ask top players things like that really help also trying to model myself after after other high level commentators i think one of the commentators that i really really enjoyed um when it came down to learning more in a style and trying to see what i can improve see how he does it with sage him i think when i started to listen to him more and see how he did things see how you did things see how tk did things see how uh golden boy how see, see how he did things golden boy's a god <laughs> it's just like there's a lot that i'm not doing that i never thought about that i never looked at it that way that i had to just tell people like i feel like i should just start from scratch start from zero and then use that as a foundation instead and i think you you worded that so well that there's a lot that when it comes down to commentary you have to think about for maybe for a lot and for a lot of people too especially when it comes down to the the highest stage at evo at ceo at genesis overwatch league at the finals there is a lot of people who are going to be watching for the first time and if they don't know a lot of things and if you're not able to provide a commentary which they can digest easier i'm probably repeating at this point but they can digest it easier they're not going to learn anything they're just going to be like oh i could have muted this and just be hype with you know what's what's going on but yes you, commentary has to evolve that way and i think hearing it from you and then seeing other people do it as well is really important to know that those are the directions i mean i guess maybe somebody will come out come back to this video and say like how do i learn commentary and they'll probably be like well hey look here's vicky kitty she's kind of like explaining you know her background but also teaching you guys some things i hope people can kind of see this on this video so we've kind of talked about you know success the criticism right that you kind of faced and i feel like you you did a really good job right like i think that's something that i've also had to learn is 
I've, I've never been told someone, I've never been told by anybody like, oh yeah, you suck. I've always been told like, hey Vance, I think you can do this better. And I'll, and I'll look and I'll listen to them and I'll talk to them like, yeah, teach me, tell me. I want to know more. So we've, we've kind of gone through that. Looking at where you are right now and where you're going, what, what are your plans? I mean, I'm, what, what's amazing to know is that, you know, before we set up the date for the show, you know, I know that you and I both knew like you had, you know, you were doing you're doing commentary for Overwatch contenders. You do, you have a set schedule, and I'm like, wow, she's she's not because we don't have any Smash tournaments, unfortunately. But it's good to know that like somebody with your level, you're you're doing like a really good job. You're, you're you have everyday commentary. You're doing Overwatch. I hope you can do a Valorant. You know, I know that's the that's the new hot topic of the you know yeah the town. Uh, I don't know if you have been approached. You know, have you been approached by the way? I actually have been approached okay. to do Valorant, but I, okay, so I have like this rule for myself where I don't want to commentate games that I don't play because I get better Perfect. in depth, like look into the game until I play it. And I personally, I, I, although I mentioned the fact that I grew up like and sneaking onto my dad's account playing Counter Strike, that was when I was literally like six years old and I haven't touched that game like probably since. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that's Counter Strike and this is Valorant, but when it comes to like, playing more passive in and i'm so used to running gun games i haven't tried out valorant like that yet so until i do is when i would take up the offer but i have approached um by the florida team to uh try out valorant that's in my plans eventually i i again i don't want to say that i would get into it until you see me like yeah, yeah. streaming valorant or actively talking about valorant it probably won't happen well, then I need to find that time first because now season two of Overwatch started up for me and I've been really focused on that. And I also like want to find a balance within Smash since I, you know, I, I, I want to still have Smash in my pocket. And that's what, kind of what I want to talk about too. Like, you know, maybe some people, uh, the best way I could structure this for anybody out there and for everyone listening for me to ask is now that you're doing Overwatch, it's good to know that, you know, you don't plan on leaving Smash. You kind of want to find that balance. How yeah. do you... Do you want to branch out to other games? And if you do, how how do you find balance right now currently, even with Smash and Overwatch? I know the the one thing that we're kind of fortunate slash unfortunate is that, like we don't have that many events. You know, we don't have majors or regionals, you know, happening right now. A lot of them are sub tournaments. So that kind of gives people some time to you know like, oh okay, I can kind of do this now. But how do you plan to balance those two? And if there's any other game that you would love to do commentary, you know? Um, that's the question. So that's actually that I'm struggling with right because since I haven't done a Smash, like an actual like national tournament setting of commentary mm -hmm. since Evo Japan. And that was in January when I had done the event with Virum and mm -hmm. uh and I if I could tell you right now, I've only been doing Overwatch for like the last half year for what it seems, and I I don't know how it's gonna be when I get back into Smash. I know my definitely gonna but finding that balance is hard. Like, I, when we're talking about, like, you know, prominent casters, I want to highlight Golden Boy because Golden Boy has casted. So, I mean, he's now more so an MC, but he's... Sorry, you, you, cut, you cut out for a second. So many different games. No worries. Um, so, Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're good, yeah. It, like, comes in and out. Can you hear me better? Perfect. Okay. So, Golden Boy has done a plethora of games that it is so impressive how he could consistently balance it. But if I minimize the games that I want to focus on to at least three to four games, that in itself seems like a lot, especially at like a high level way of, of talking about it. But like it, it, it feels necessary. You have to think about right now the position of Smash. You have to think about the fact that we, I'm going to be real here. The reality of us having a comfortable tournament where we could take in over 3,000 entrances, I don't see it happening for another year. And yeah. I, I don't think that's something that is digestible to some people to to face the reality of. I don't think that we are, as a country, I don't think we're going to be in the position to host another Genesis 6 for another year and a half, maybe a year, maybe mm -hmm. for the next few Genesis. I don't know how that's going to play out. but And I don't know how the position of Smash may be in by then either. But it's it's a difficult reality because we have to stay safe. This is far from like going away and we don't even have a vaccine. And I and again, we have immunocompromised individuals within the community. We mm -hmm. things that we have to think about. And it's difficult to, to see a world where we could go back to tournaments that you have players shoulder to shoulder in a room looking behind the really hype set and being able to cheer and get hype over it with, you know, the breath of, you know, the FGC player over your neck and as you're trying to play. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. 
things are going to change. And to think about the position of where Smash currently is, I don't feel comfortable with it because this is actually my livelihood. Aside from streaming, like it's casting right now. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to try to take it further to, to get to that golden boy level. I want to be able to get there because this is a passion of mine. And this is something that I feel like I could integrate it with a future job that I may want to come across, whether it be with a Nintendo itself or another company. I just want to be able to push forward with this and also get to know a lot of different communities because within Overwatch right now, I'm having the time of my life. That community is so welcoming. Mm -hmm. Now, I could say that um, because that community doesn't have the grassroots that I'm used to having from Smash Brothers, that personality that we get to know players that we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, getting oh, to know their stories yeah. and stuff like that, it's a lot easier because you said it yourself. You sat down with Charlie. You ate in with Charlie. You got to know Charlie. And then you could reiterate those facts on the mic. Whereas these players that I am casting for in Overwatch... These players are constantly being, like, giving contracts, getting retracted, getting put into another team every, like, three weeks, it feels yeah. like. It, it feels like these players are constantly shifting teams, like, every single month. And, I, again, like, I just finished casting the July tournament for mm -hmm. Overwatch Contenders North America and Europe, and the teams that I just casted with the rosters in those teams may very well be a completely different roster next month in August. Yeah. And now that we're in August. So, like... <laughs> Things are constantly changing in Overwatch that I'm not used to in Smash. You know, you have contracts with players getting signed annually. And then in Overwatch, you have players getting signed every six weeks. Yeah. And it's like, if they don't perform in those six weeks, they get re-signed by somebody else or they just retire. And that's, yeah. it, it's, it's a cruel world. I, there is no room for error, in my opinion, because it is incredibly difficult to stand out in a game where you have five other teammates who also need to be putting in work. So you have to think about yourself as an individual player and what makes yourself brandable and like what makes teams like look at you and say, yes, this one sticks out amongst the rest. Let's look at this guy or let's move him up to tier one. Let's move him up to Overwatch League and like get him signed by one of those big uh, teams. So when it comes to like the differentiation between Overwatch and Smash at the moment, my focus is primarily on Overwatch mm. with Smash still being there for me because I do want to continuously do Smash because Smash is a game that if you don't touch for a while or you don't read up on and you're not updated with, believe it or not, you will fall behind. Oh, and man, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, like everybody now, the the meta you could even say for for Smash has shifted because now we are we are on Wi-Fi. The I'm gonna say it right now. The Wi-Fi way of Smash is not real Smash. Like, that. by real Ooh. Smash, I mean, like, in real life Smash. It's not. Like, the characters that you see excelling online are not the same characters. Yeah, it's getting hot. Got them hot takes in here. And they're not going to be the same characters and the same players you're going to see excel in a real tournament where you go in to Genesis sit down, plug in your controller, and fist bump your opponent right next to you. Like, And that isn't to say that the players that are excelling on Wi-Fi right now won't do well at those tournaments, but you're going to have players like MKLeo, Samsora, they're going to be the ones that you see mo probably on a big stage where right now in the Wi-Fi rankings, those two players aren't where you would expect to see them on the PGR that was released before quarantine happened. So... I, I again like things are constantly shifting and being updated with the way that things are shifting is super important so if I'm constantly focused too focused on overwatch if that balance isn't there for smash I'm gonna get I'm gonna fall behind so yeah. I need to I need to be able to to balance things and still be up to date with smash and the way that I do that is staying in touch with other fellow casters I was just talking to hazmat and bam like two days ago mm. I'm still streaming Wi-Fi tournaments. Uh, sorry, not Wi-Fi tournaments. Wi-Fi viewer battles within my own stream when I want to play Smash. But again, like, playing Wi-Fi, <laughs> it takes away from my mental health, dude. I'll be so honest no, with you. I'm like, with you, you, talk with you. About, you talk about getting salty in tournament, man. I guess I get salty when I play Sonic Master 2, 2019 out here. Like, I can't. I just, like... You know, it, and it's about it, it's about readapting though. Like there yeah, yeah, is yeah. a meta on Wi-Fi that you need to readapt around. It's just like the way that you would play in real life, and it's just a matter of relearning the game in a different way. Now, if you want to do that, that's up to you. Because guess what? When tournaments start up again, you gotta relearn now mm -hmm. how tournaments are gonna evolve when you get back into the fray and. Things may not be the same. You're going to have players that are extremely rusty. I know a lot of top-level players aren't playing that much Smash anymore. I mean, look at Light. 
Yeah. You know, I I'm I'm not seeing him play that much Smash, and oh. again, like I don't I don't necessarily blame him either. Like yeah. I I I can't I I can't be on Wi Fi twenty four seven because that thing takes away at my mental health. Hold on, I think I think you might have cut off here, Ooh. but I, but I totally agree. It it kills like I think it was uh so here here like. Like, you guys have your own, like, you talked about how Florida, you know, you guys have your specialists or player players. Here in the 818, you know, I'm blessed to have Key, Zan. I know a lot of people know Zan, uh, but Key, Zan, Arrow, uh, HLB, and all these other players, right? and they're also specialists of their own characters. So the one thing that they told me, you know, especially Key, who's the Ryu specialist, is he always told me, like, dude, Vance, not playing Smash Wi-Fi is self-care. Play something else. You know, go play Skull Girls. Go play something with a better netcode. Do yourself a favor. And I was like, all right, Key, I, I promise, I promise, I'll take care of myself that way. But I agree, it, it's really, really hard. And I, and spoilers, you know, because this is the first season. I told every, I kind of want to. I'm not gonna necessarily tell everyone, but I'm telling you all here as a scoop. This is a full season. This is this may be the pilot episode, but I guarantee you, this is a full season of a talk show that I'm doing for you guys. So there, I will have a certain Sonic player. Who will come here and he will definitely give us thoughts of what it's like to be a Sonic player in the current state of Wi Fi. And if you guys know, I don't want to spoil his name. I think Vicky, you may know who he is, but he will give us thoughts of, you know, what it's like to be, you know, and, and that's kind of one of those things that changes, right? The meta. You know, that's why I see, I'm surprised when I see Charlie stream or Nico stream and Larry stream. It's because they're not streaming Wi Fi that much. If they are, it's like, I have a sub tournament. <laughs> or I'm just going to go ahead and mess around. And even me, when I play Wi-Fi, I tell everybody, yeah. I'm not going to go my main. I don't feel like going my main because I feel like if I go my main, great, I get to fight another Spammy Ness, another Runaway Sonic, another another K. Rool who enjoys throwing crown at me. It's not fun. It's not fun for me. It's... It's it's and it's extra funny because I want to call the last patch that Min, Min came out, I want to call it the Vicky patch. And you know why? Because Corrin is great again. I love Corrin right now in this patch. Kirby got that kill power that no one sees. Kirby hits like a truck and people be slip sleeping because that character blows up at like 60% after you sneeze on him. And like, I, I, I just really, I'm enjoying this patch a lot. And I'm enjoying Min Min a lot. And I really, really wish that since I haven't really seen that many people, especially people that I've played like Smash with hands on like in real life. Mm. Because right now Florida's not in the best state. Um, with COVID-19, <laughs> yep. it's really not people. I don't know. People are out here wilding, but <laughs> I haven't been able to really like to, to really take advantage of the patch. And it's unfortunate because I really, I really miss tournaments. Like I oh, really I miss tournaments. I, I really too. miss my friends and I really miss like casting smash. I have to admit, and it's just difficult because it's not the same environment, but then you take away smash and you take into the, the fact that I was going to do Overwatch even if this COVID thing wasn't in the mm. picture. I contracted to do Overwatch before I even went to EVO Japan. And oh, wow. my time, yeah, yeah, my time within Overwatch contenders was going to be in Germany. So, like, while this entire time, like, this entire season of us doing Smash stuff, I was, I, my entire schedule, the weekend that I was supposed to go to Germany was the weekend that the president had closed all our borders for us going to Europe. And it was the day before I was scheduled to get on a flight to go to Germany. So I was like, oh, okay, things are getting serious. Okay, I can't go to Germany now. So I was going to go to Germany to full bloom, from full bloom back to Germany, to back home, to Momocon to back to Germany, to then Evo. I was gonna do a bunch of stuff. I was literally, I was like registered to do so many Smash events, so many like events in general that I was like gonna pop off in 2020. And it's unfortunate that things played out the way that they did, but it's also fortunate that I was able to readapt with the current living situation and bring everything remote. Like, you know, shout out to Nintendo and Blizzard. They've actually have been able to help me out equipment wise. So like, keep everything in, in top-notch quality mm -hmm. in, in broadcasting because I actually just finished doing the uh, Nintendo um, Atlantic Open. I, not I Atlantic Open. Say, yeah, it was, yeah. Open, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that they had just hosted online for Smash Brothers within the month of July. And they have future tournaments that they've been announcing that they're going to be cons the, consistently doing with online tournaments for Smash. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's something to keep your eyes out on because at least, like, they're getting involved in their own way. But that has been the extent of my involvement in Smash. It hasn't been, like, 
Because you know when it comes to doing the Nintendo broadcast and then let's say Shine broadcast, yeah. I, t- I my approach to commentary is more technical within Shine because I know the audience to people watching Shine are probably competitors themselves aside from the general o- general audience. But then right. when it comes to like Nintendo broadcast, I keep into consideration that the majority of people who get that notification that Nintendo is live are people who are on, of the general audience more so yeah. than the competitive audience. So I, I cater towards that. But then you have like a situation where I don't have that that uh, traditional format of what I already know of when it comes to Smash tournaments and not getting into that rhythm. It will throw me off for a bit. I know for a fact when I get back to casting Smash Brothers, I will have to readapt around my pacing because currently Overwatch has been like that one thing to take place for the last like six months. I've, that's all I've been doing. And uh, mm. another game that I actually want to pick up on uh, is actually Apex Legends. I want to look into casting Apex in the future. I'm I'm actually one of those people that are really excited when Xbox announced that oh Halo is going to be free for everyone. I was like, say no more. If I could if I could find a way to do Halo commentary, Vance will be happy. And I'm with you. I as a commentator, I was this was going to be the year that I told myself I'm finally going to travel, set my set what I need to do to get myself out there a little bit more. You know, make the highlight reels, go to a few more events. I funny that you mentioned it. I was going to travel to Japan and Korea. Uh, one of my best friends, uh, she got married. She decided to live out there with her husband. And they were going to, you know, they opened the doors to me. They told me, if you want to come out here and I know that you want to travel, I was going to, what was it? I think it was Umarbora. Yeah, I was going to go for an Umarbora just to, like, try to make some content, do something unique in Japan for Umarbora, and then go to Korea, see what I see who I can meet there for the Smash scene in Korea. You know, do a little video on that, have my own kind of content. And then from there, debate if I can make enough money to go to Momocon, go to Momocon, you know, see my two GG friends there, and then f- fly back to the US. But yeah, things change. Uh, we had to adapt. And I just told everybody, I think this was kind of almost the blessing in disguise that I needed to push myself in the direction to finally get this podcast out here, which is why it's happening. And also, you guys should definitely give a huge shout out to Vicky Katie for being part of this episode. But you know, when it comes down to it, I think y- we've covered a lot. You know, we, we've gone from, you know, the beginning of, like, hey, I used to sneak into my uncle's room, play, you know, play his games. And then I went from, like, hey, you know, I, I'm Biggie Smalls with a guy who's 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> and, <laughs> now, and now I'm, like, hey, see me in Overwatch contenders. I think you've had a very, very good, like, I don't even know how to describe it. You had a very good, like, you know, what it's like to grow up playing games have a passion for them and turn and you know still go to university right and have that like you know what i think this is my passion this is my calling this is what i want to do this is so fun it's not even my job anymore it's something i just enjoy you know uh then i'm almost a loss for i feel like we, we got we got a show i feel i feel like we got a show yeah. i i and I wish I could, you know, originally, for those of you guys wondering, I kind of wanted to put this live, but also at the same time, the original issue that I had with a couple of podcasts that I did was, and it's not, it's no one's fault, it's kind of more of my fault, is I feel like we should have pre-recorded them first, and then set them as a season, and then re-release them as, as is. I kind of wanted to do this show live, but I wanted to do this in a different style, so I apologize if you guys wish this was live, you know, there's a lot that I'm trying to do here, you know, if... If season one takes off, I'll try to bring back Vicky for season two and do like a live Q and A thing going on here. Uh, and I know she's. And what's cool is that she's super. I'm glad you're super busy. I'm glad that like you have something that you enjoy every day, and then you're able to do commentary for Overwatch. I think one question, you know, if if there were to be a general audience question, which I wish I had, but I kind of wanted to keep this secret for everyone, and then surprise everyone like, hey guys, look, this is podcast. Um, one question, I guess I want to ask you. Uh, and if and if and if this is if it's too much, it's not a you know it's a not a loaded question. I think it's a pretty cool question that I want to ask you is if you could do commentary for one thing right now, like if you could do commentary for one game that you haven't had the time, like you said, you're juggling a lot of things. You want to make sure that you can keep consistent. And I know you talked about Valorant and Apex Legends. If you could do commentary for something different, what would you do and why? Uh it's difficult to answer that only because I think the one game I really, really, really want to get into right now mm. for commentary is is really Apex, and oh, yeah. the reason and the reason why I'm I'm gonna still fall into that into that game is because throughout the quarantine, 
I didn't play Apex before. I started playing Apex around early April to like late, late March. Um, and like I fell in love with the game. I again, like I'm very, very into shooters, and like, like this is gonna be it's a, probably I don't know of a shock, but um, uh, plot twist. I actually have more hours clocked into Overwatch than I do in Smash Four and Smash Ultimate combined. Think about that real quick because I go to a lot of tournaments and I play yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot. I play Smash a lot, like a lot. And when it came to Overwatch, I've been playing that game since beta. Mm -hmm. And I was huge on Overwatch. Like you don't see it in the background, but I have a wall on my left that is covered from the roof to the floor with posters. Oh, and I have like, not only Nintendo like stuff on my desk currently, but Tracer stuff is like everywhere. Like I have a lot of Diva, a lot of Zenyatta, a lot of like Overwatch in general. So like, if you wanted to ask me that question before I did Overwatch, my answer would have been Overwatch because of <laughs> how much of a fan I am of that of, of the game. Um, and even after so many years of the game being out, I'm still very much in love with that game. I think that game is incredibly fun. But when I was playing Ape in uh, quarantine, that was the one game to get me off of Overwatch that wasn't Smash. And I haven't stopped playing Apex. I think I play Apex every single day. Wow. ever since the whole pandemic's been a thing and uh i started playing ranked and i i think i'm actually pretty good at the game like i okay. i am with a pretty high ranking within the game i play on console though so i don't know if my word has any value <laughs> but it's I, interesting I feel like it does now. That, uh, well it's interesting because when it comes to the apex scene mm -hmm. and uh i'm actually in contact with an individual who runs the playstation uh the console like league within apex uh specifically like the playstation side of things and he's also involved with smash himself and he like streams a lot of persona his name is uh your bud tevin mm -hmm. uh he, he started out on console but so did all the top level apex players actually this started on playstation so i think that's special and uh within a pc game especially with shooters because you know you even within overwatch because overwatch is all that competition is with on within pc uh you the players all started in within pc because that's the optimal way of playing the game not only yeah. is it but it's just optimal and uh it's interesting because it's almost backwards where you have uh players like daltouche who started out on playstation 4 for apex and now this dude's a god even on pc and the these top level players still resort to playing on playstation 4 sometimes and then going back to pc because it apparently the only difference is the mouse and keyboard thing but yeah. you could still make really big plays with a controller in that game and that's what makes the game interesting at least in my opinion from somebody who has a hard time at i have very small hands um so to <laughs> adjust with the keyboard i i've like i'm actually taking a new approach at like turning my keyboard sideways so that way maybe i can have an easier time because my hand cramps up a lot and that's the only reason why i don't play uh keyboard games too often because when i do it really hurts and i i, I actually got scared that i was gonna get carpal tunnel on keyboard before smash gave it to me so <laughs> so i was like <laughs> if, if i don't get it from playing smash i'm gonna get it like this keyboard I'm like, I need some help. I don't know if I'm doing this wrong or if my hands are just way too small for a keyboard because I definitely have smaller hands. Like, and I don't know if that's a problem, but it cramps up and it really is bothersome. And I really wish that wasn't the case because like, again, I really want to get into Valorant and stuff like that. And I think that little barrier is what's making me scared of getting involved. But um, I'm slowly starting to break that because I've become like very big also on Final Fantasy XIV. Um, oh, it, which I, is, I like, just started an playing it, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, I, I, that was the first, because I built a PC myself earlier in the year before, like, the whole quarantine happened. So, one, mm -hmm. that was a blessing in disguise because my previous desk, my, my previous, like, PC was absolutely trash. Like, it, this, I, it barely, my graphics card was smaller than my hand that I'm talking about. Like, my hands are small. My graphics card was even smaller than that. So, like, I, I completely built a PC, like, from the ground up. And, like, it, it, it was, it's amazing. My computer's great. Um, and I, again, it just came out in the blessing in disguise. And now I can play games that I wasn't able to play before. So, Final Fantasy XIV was the first game that I, like, I literally pushed my PC to play at its full setting and seeing everything, like, working in full force. And just, like, it was beautiful. It was a, an amazing, experience and like seeing that out now now i can play like games like valorant and overwatch on computer that i couldn't play in the same level on my console and now with apex though i like re reverted back to console <laughs> because i heard that like a lot of the top level players also played on playstation 4 
So that's what I've been doing thus far. And I've been climbing in that game. And I, after casting Overwatch and seeing the different pacing of casting, like, unfold within, like, casting a 6v6 and, like, building up story building mm -hmm. and the differentiation between Overwatch casting and Smash casting, it, I could, again, your podcast would go on for another hour if I talked about the way that the casting styles are so different. The floor, and like, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is the way that I had to adjust as a caster was hard. Like, mm -hmm. I still get extremely nervous when I cast Overwatch because um, I, I fall back on terms that have been integrated in my mind as a caster right. for Smash. I say, instead of mirror matching, I call it dittoing. You know, instead of saying excuses, I say John. And then you got people out here saying, who the hell is John? <laughs> and I'm out here like, oh, God. Oh God, I have to watch out. Take your audience into consideration. And that's yeah. like part of the job. You got to readjust around the different game. If you want to balance yourself out as a caster, you have to understand how to readjust around the different games and the way that pacing works. Because as a caster, at the end of the day, you're narrating a story. You're a story building. And not only are you building the player stories, but you're building how the game is progressing. And you're supposed to say that to the audience. So that way the audience is up to date. They are they, they could turn away from the screen and not look at everything happening frame by frame to understand what's going on because they have you to tell them for them. Wow. I think you've just wrapped up the show in a way that I could. I don't know. I'm, I, that's it. <laughs> that's that's the episode guys i think that's that's the perfect way to wrap it up vicky thank you so much for being a part of the show honestly it's been a pleasure it's been an honor not only getting to know the little fun facts of like i have small hands i love fps's you know i i'm, I'm doing overwatch i love apex legends i'm a big fps fan i think yeah it's it's been a real honor to have you on the show and thank you so much for coming on for the first episode for the pilot for the first season um, and I hope we can get you back. Guys, if you love this, if you like what you're seeing, you know, hit the subscribe button, hit the like, reach out to Vicky Kitty too. Sure, give her some love. You know, she it's great to hear compliments. But Vicky, if people want to reach out to you, if people want to see you, where, where can they find you? Let, let, let the people know. Tier 2 for Overwatch Contenders. Go to the YouTube.com slash Overwatch Contenders um, for every August, September, October, November tournament going up to that day. It's going to be great. It's going to be happening at the end of the month. And then you could also check out my Twitter channel. It's going to be at Vicky Kitty, just as you know, you have it spelled out right here. Or my stream, twitch.tv slash Vicky Kitty. I'll be streaming Apex Legends, Overwatch, Smash Brother viewer battles, and trying to balance out my stream in the way that I try to balance out my commentary. But thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, and I'm happy to be part of the pilot episode. Yeah. Well, guys, I... Like, like Vicky said, she could go for an hour talking about this, and I hope you guys enjoy her also, you know, telling you guys the ropes. But I think it's about time we wrap up the main show. We're going to have a little bit of a post show, and I'm going to try to figure out where I can place that as content, so I apologize if it's on a different channel, if it's on the same channel. Um, you guys can also find this. Yes, I am officially working. I'm putting this on Spotify. It'll be on the YouTube. So definitely, if you guys want to just listen to us as a podcast, you guys will be able to. It'll be on SoundCloud. I'm going to try to do that as well. But until next time, guys, it has been my pleasure to serve you. Stay safe and be kind to one another. And this has been DI Radio.